Hello everyone! I'm Jen and I make useful English Lit study videos on Shakespeare, poetry, fiction, literary ideas and more to help you become a literary expert. So in this video today we are reading what's probably the most famous poem written by one of the most widely studied female poets of all time and that's Emily Dickinson's Because I Could Not Stop for Death. Now, mortality was a constant preoccupation for Dickinson, who suffered chronic ill health over the course of her life. In Dickinson's last decade, her parents, siblings, and her favourite nephew all passed away in close succession, which troubled, depressed, and exacerbated the poet's already frail physical and mental state. Because Dickinson published very few poems in her lifetime, most of her writing were undated, so it's tricky to pinpoint just exactly when or what event might have triggered a specific rumination on death like in Because I Could Not Stop. But in any case, and perhaps unsurprising really for many poets, death was one of Dickinson's favourite themes. Now, one of the most striking immediate observations that we might make about this poem is that death isn't actually portrayed as this scary thing, contrary to the usual way that most of us would think about dying. Instead, death is personified as a kind, patient gentleman who takes the speaker and her companions on a leisurely ride towards where we're not quite sure. And this question of where death's carriage ultimately leads is an intriguing one. Indeed, does the journey even have an end point? Or, as the final line states, does it move towards eternity? In which case, where does eternity actually land? And does achieving this eternality mean a transcendence beyond life and even death? So let's explore all of these ideas by diving straight into the analysis coming right up. So the poem begins with an intriguingly bold statement. The speaker claims, I could not stop for death. So is the speaker immortal? After all, every human being must at some point stop for death, literally. And indeed, line four seems to verify this reading of immortality, as immortality and ourselves are cast as companions in this carriage ride, while the end rhyme of me with mortality creates a sort of sonic harmony that matches the speaker, me, with the concept immortality. This suggestion may seem grandiose, but ironically, the tone that delivers the idea is humble, with Dickinson personifying death as this kindly, patient driver who waits on his passengers. The journey is a slow one, as he, death, knew no haste, now, similarly, for most people, the progression from birth to death is also slow, or at least a gradual one. So at the start of the poem, Dickinson already establishes this analogy between the carriage ride driven by death and the gradual process of human life. So we're told that he knew no haste, but the following lines describing their journey with death seems to suggest otherwise as the syntactical and prosodic patterns create a hurried pace. For instance, after the midline caesura of We Slowly Drove, punctuated by Dickinson's signature dash mark, the line spanning across five to seven in an enjammed flurry from He Knew No Haste all the way to Leisure Two, and this accelerated propulsive pace is reinforced by the frantic, throbbing rhythm that overarches stanza three. The triple repetition of we passed the score, we passed the fields, we passed the setting sun sharpens the montage-like nature of the rider's experience, which suggests that the locations were only briefly acknowledged and viewed in passing. And actually, this is not unlike how a lot of us experience and go through life, perhaps especially for those of us living in urban, digitally connected and hyper-stimulating cities, where the rapid rhythms of living are characterized by exactly the sort of superficial passing by with very little time left for savoring each place, person and incident in the present. By the way, guys, if you find this video helpful so far, I'd massively appreciate it if you could hit the thumbs up button below and subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss out on any of my top grade lit study content going forward. I'd also encourage you to check out my membership program by clicking the join button below if you want exclusive access to members only study content and make special video requests. I'll see you there.
But till this point in the poem, the journey seems to at least be a smooth and pleasant one, as implied by the alliterative fluidity of descriptions like the school strove, at recess the ring, gazing grain and setting sun with the sibilants and the plosives. In any case, the consonantal echoes create an overall impression of a harmonious landscape where all the elements come together in a natural organic unity. The turn into stanza four, however, introduces a curious reversal of perspective. Rather than we passing the scenery, he passed us. But who is this he? It doesn't really make sense to think that he here refers to death, because death is already in the driving seat. So perhaps then, this he is more a transcendent sort of presence, perhaps God, or perhaps a spiritual source of deliverance that's capable of instilling a sense of sublime in the speaker and by extension, the reader. In the context of Romanticism, the sublime is a concept that refers to the feelings of awe and terror that one often feels in the midst of nature. The British Romantics, like Wordsworth, Coleridge and Shelley, often describe sublime nature as being imposing and massive structures like mountains. Think Mont Blanc in Frankenstein, or the phrase the huge black peak in Wordsworth's prelude. But for an American romantic poet like Dickinson, sublimity can also be found and felt in prosaic smaller settings like the little town that the speaker views from Death's Carriage. Overwhelming emotions doesn't have to come just from grand majestic sightings. They can be elicited as well when we reframe the way we see the everyday as things we take for granted while alive, such as the school, the cornfields, the sun, by the speaker, but grow to cherish as we realize that death and the subsequent loss of all of these lovely, comforting, homely scenes will inevitably and eventually arrive at our doorstep. So this is an awareness that brings chills to the speaker as the dews drew quivering and chill and forces the speaker's focus and perspective to zoom in from the broader landscape to the sharper granularities that activate her sensorial faculties all the more, as a testament to the fact that she is still indeed living. This begins with the tactile imagery of only gossamer, my gown, my tippet, only tulle, which are specific garments and textiles worn by the speaker as she feels the cloth of her dress against her skin with that physical feeling mirrored for the reader on a sonic level in those alliterative places of gossamer, gown, tippet, tulle, etc. Stanza 5 is perhaps the most symbolic stanza in the poem. There's a tension between the familiar and the eerie, as the house, which is a motif traditionally associated with the home, comfort and safety, is instead portrayed as this secluded, mysterious and anomalous structure that stands out and doesn't quite fit within the otherwise harmonious tableau. On the one hand, the swelling of the ground could invite both maternal and phallic associations, whereby the swelling of the male sexual organ leads to the swelling of the female womb, in which case we would land on the idea of birth, not death. But we're then told that the roof was scarcely visible, the roof being another possible phallic motif, and this creates a hazy, confusing impression of the cornice being in the ground, where cornices are most usually placed under rooftops and thus be at the top of the house. So is the implication then that even when the actual conditions for the creation of life and birth are present, such as a man and a woman falling in love or uniting in marriage to start a family, there will nonetheless always be external and unanticipated circumstances like these fogs surrounding the house that might throw intended plans into uncertainty and invite confusion. So as a woman who remained single and childless throughout her life, Dickinson nonetheless had various romantic interests, although they were never consummated. Now, scholars mostly agree that Dickinson was in love with her sister-in-law, Susan Gilbert, and at another point with the Reverend Charles Wordsworth, with whom she shared her writings and remained in frequent correspondence until his death. So these unconsummated romantic relationships would probably have evoked deep introspection in Dickinson herself, as the house of her love life became a private, secret domain where there were often swellings of hope, longing and desire, but because of various circumstances in her life, never quite materialised into anything concrete or gained any sort of final closure.
Finally, stanza six reveals that this ride with death is actually a retrospective memory, which seems to have happened a long time ago, as indicated by the phrase to centuries, but feels ever present and palpable to the speaker as it feels shorter than the day. Now, there's a sense that having gone on this journey of viewing life at a distance from the vantage of their near-death experience, the speaker has now achieved a quiet but transcendent epiphany. Life, it seems, is not this teleological journey where birth proceeds linearly to death. It proceeds toward eternity with moments interspersed where we come close to the hand of death and through the sharpened awareness of our brush against mortality and the porousness between living and dying, we gain a level of clarity that forces us to be more conscious of how we live in the present, experience and take in the world around us sharply. To see the pedestrian but lovely landscape more clearly, to feel the clothes against our skin and to register the softness of it. To notice that we do feel chills and perhaps rejoice in these tranquil moments when nothing really seems to happen on the outside, but are nonetheless capable of inspiring deep feeling and appreciation within our soul if we let it. And that's it for this analysis, everyone. And I know some of the ideas might be a bit quirky and off the beaten track, but since there's already so many resources and viewpoints out there for reference, I reckon that, you know, there's always room for us to be a little bit more creative with our interpretation. And ultimately, it doesn't matter how popular a literary text is, there is always, always possibility for new innovative angles to look at the same thing. So I'd love to hear what your specific angle is, so leave a comment below with your thoughts. For your next video, I recommend that you watch my analysis on John Keats' Ode to a Nightingale, which is another widely studied poem that I love and that you may have or will eventually come across in your literary studies. It will also give you a good counterpoint to Dickinson's work because Keats was working also in the Romanticist tradition and also a master at seeing the sublime in the mundane, but obviously with a lot of stylistic divergences, especially when Keats was working in the British versus Dickinson's American context. And make sure you hit the thumbs up button below if you found this video helpful so that you can encourage me to keep making these useful lit study videos for you and all the other passionate lit learners around the world. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and switch on that bell notification so you don't miss out on any of my videos going forward. You can also consider joining my membership program for exclusive video requests and essay review perks. You can check that out in the description box below or click the join button. As always, I will see you in the next one.